Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to be with you again here on Tuesday evening uh, on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. And my name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of the Preterist Research Institute. Um, I guess Daniel Rogers, who's been with me the last couple of weeks and who has, in fact, filled in when I was sick on one Tuesday evening. Uh, I guess he completely forgot about us this evening. Uh, we'll see if he checks in here uh, a little bit, but uh, he may be, uh, you know, completely indisposed, maybe completely busy. I didn't hear from him at all today, so I don't really know uh, if he's able to be with us uh, or not, or if he simply forgot. But that's all right. I'm glad to be with you. And a little bit of a report, as you know, William Bell, who is always my co-host here on this program is in Ghana, and while when it was announced that he was going to be there, when the word got out into the community, uh, a minister for the largest church of Christ in several cities, evidently, uh, sent a debate challenge to William, stating that he would host the debate, their church, and they wanted three debates over a period of two days, and William gladly accepted. Well, okay, William has been there almost a month. He is actually due to be back, or to come back, I should say, uh, on Friday evening about 11 o'clock. I don't know if that's our time or if that's their time. I really don't know. But anyway, once he got there, and once they started trying to nail down the details of the debate, the actual venue, whether or not it was actually going to be on TV like they initially said it would be, uh, the propositions, all of a sudden, the gentleman who had issued the challenge started, well, in, uh, in Arkansas and Oklahoma, we got a term for it, uh, and that term is crawfishing. All of a sudden, he started making every excuse in the world. Well, uh, going to have to reschedule, going to have to do this, going to have to do that. Don't know. Uh, I don't know if uh, don't know if we could hold it in my church building or not. And on and on and on the excuses went. And I just heard from Daniel. Uh, Daniel thought that William was supposed to be back for tonight's program, <laughs> and so he didn't. Uh, uh, he didn't dial in. So perhaps he will here momentarily. But be that as it may, okay. Point of fact is, uh, today William corresponded with me, and said that it's basically a charade being undertaken by the folks who challenged him to a debate. They have now said again that they want to change the venue. There won't be any television. Uh, the man that issued the challenge initially evidently is a young guy. And then there's another guy involved, and I, I'll be very, very honest, I 
I may have gotten some of the details uh, kind of confused, but one of the two individuals is actually kind of an overseer. I don't know how that works. Uh, over 150 preachers. They all look up to him. They, they all look to him. And so, anyway, uh, at the last that I corresponded with William today, there is no guarantee at all that the debate is going to happen. The, uh, the challenger, by the way, had actually uh, issued a statement that he would absolutely not affirm a position. He would only be in the negative for all. Now, folks, I got to tell you that that is just highly, highly unusual. Um, it's it's simply not fair. It's not normal for one man to be strictly in the affirmative or the or to be strictly in the negative. There has to be some equity involved. And obviously, the challenger is not interested <clears throat> in equity and fairness. He wants to stack the deck as much as possible. So the last time I corresponded with William, at that time early this afternoon, whether or not there was going to be a debate was very highly questionable. Uh, haven't heard from him since then. He's, of course, William was very, very eager to go ahead and to have the debate. He said he was willing to accommodate them in whatever way he could uh, because it's so important. And yet, from all appearances sake, and obviously I'm in America, they're in Ghana. I don't know all of the ins. I don't know all of the outs. I don't know about the negotiations that have been taking place. All I know is that it has the appearance that the challenger has discovered who it is that he challenged and has come to the realization that it would not be in his best interest to engage in a debate with William Bell. Now, I'll, I'll share with you another anecdote that has happened to me just recently. I won't give any names. But I was approached earlier this year about a formal public debate to be held in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And my response was, I'd love to do that. I'll be more than happy to do that. Uh, the, the gentleman that, uh, that challenged me seemed to be well-known, seemed to be well-respected. He is a man that was uh, that is considered to be a gentlemen. Uh, so again, I gladly accepted. Uh, he then told me that the debate couldn't happen for a couple of different months because the, uh, the church that he was at was in the process of, of selling the building that they had and uh, moving to a new venue. So, and so it would be, uh, according to his words, it would be a couple of months. I said, that's not a, not a problem whatsoever. I said, just let me know. Well, I checked in with him uh, from time to time during the interim period, and it was the same issue. And then finally, during our correspondence, he told me, he said, well, I've decided that I'm not going to engage in a debate with you until, and he gave the name of a, of a scholar in his fellowship from Australia. And the gentleman from Tulsa informed me that the, um, that the guy in Australia is considered their number one scholar in their fellowship. He's the top dog. And that, as a matter of fact, it might be possible that he would conduct the debate instead of the gentleman from Tulsa. And I said, that's just fine. I would be happy to do that. So he put me in touch with the gentleman from Australia. He and I corresponded back and forth ever so briefly and then finally, he, uh, he sent me an email and told me, and folks, these are his words. They're not mine. I'm simply sharing with you what happened 
And I'm sharing this with you because I, th- I think this is what happened in Ghana. The gentleman from Australia wrote to me and said, there will not be a debate with you. I did not realize that I was corresponding with the superstar of the preterist movement. Now, mind you, these are his words. They are not mine. So he he told me, he said, I will not be debating you. Well, I, I don't tell that to pat myself on the back. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't say that to exalt myself in any way whatsoever. Those, that's his terminology. That's his term. But I believe there's a direct correlation with, with what happened in Ghana. I really honestly believe, perhaps I'm wrong, but until some evidence comes along to the contrary, I'm going to believe it's true. I believe that that gentleman in Ghana issued the challenge for William to debate him, not really knowing who William Bell is, not understanding the level of scholarship that William brings to the table. And thus, after he got over there, after William got over there, and this gentleman started doing his own research, started checking into who William Bell is, I am absolutely convinced, and again, uh, unless and until some evidence comes along to convince me otherwise, I'm going to believe that the gentleman really honestly came to believe or understand who it is that William is and just decided it would be in his best interest not to engage William Bell in a formal public debate and to expose his membership to what William would have to say. Uh, You know, folks, I don't have to tell you, those of you who listen to Two Guys in the Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, I don't have to tell you who watch William on YouTube on his All Things Fulfilled program, I don't have to tell you what level of scholarship William brings. I don't have to tell you what a great communicator he is. I don't have to tell you about the the depth of his understanding of covenant eschatology. You know that. But I'm convinced the fella in Ghana did not know that. And once he found out, he decided that it was just yeah, you know, we got to find excuses not to do this. Uh, well, we can't do it at my church after all. We got to do it somewhere else. Oh, you know what? Uh, TV's not going to work out. Oh, you know what? Uh, this other preacher uh, who is, uh, quote, in charge of 150 other preachers, uh, he has uh, he's decided that maybe this is not a good idea or whatever it was that was said. Um, you You get the idea. Ladies and gentlemen, this is really, it's more than revealing. I mean, if you think that you've got the truth, if you have a man who says he is a good debater, uh, if you've got a man who issued the challenge for a debate, then fairness, courage, Christian integrity would suggest that you live up to your own challenge. And that you do what you said you were going to do. But evidently, that's not the case. And so as William and I were corresponding back and forth today, he said, well, I I don't want to offend the preacher who challenged me. And I, I responded and I said, well, I understand that. But he's the man that issued the challenge. He has a responsibility to live up to the challenge. To me, that's only fair, it's only right, it's only the proper thing to do. But uh, at the end of a correspondence with William today, and I unfortunately I had to cut it off because I, I had to meet my wife for some business. Um, you know what? It sure seemed to me, at the end of that correspondence, it sure seemed to me that there was not going to be a debate because after all, here it is Tuesday, and William is due to leave Ghana to return to the States on Friday, as I mentioned earlier. So unless they get the details worked out really, really, really fast, and it wouldn't surprise me on one level, look, they've done everything in the world so far 
to throw William uh, off of his game, so to speak, uh, to rattle him. And, and it's a dirty d- debater's trick. It's been tried with me by David Hester when we had our very first debate here at Ardmore. Uh, he openly said, he openly bragged about some things that he did that were just childish in my estimation. They, they were facile, they were childish, they were immature, and they were most assuredly ineffective. And yet David Hester bragged and boasted in front of his own congregation. I saw it on film. He bragged and boasted that he did those things hoping to rattle me. Well, I can assure you it didn't work. I, I've seen lots and lots and lots of debaters' tricks down through the years. And so the little tricks that he pulled had no effect on me. But I really believe that that's what they're trying to do with William. I think they're trying to rattle him. I, I think they're trying to unsettle him in regard to whether or not there's going to be a debate so that he shows up with uncertainty, so so, to, so that he shows up. Hey, look, they wouldn't even settle on propositions. Now think about that, folks. You challenge a man to a debate, but you won't even say, here's what I am willing to affirm, or here's what I want you to affirm, and I'll deny it. They haven't even done that. It's absolutely amazing what they have done and the tricks that they have tried to pull while William is over there. Now, I suspect, maybe wrong, but I suspect that if there's not a debate between now and Friday, that after William has to leave to come back home, I suspect that the preacher will start bragging. We issued a challenge to Dr. William Bell of all things fulfilled from the United States of America to meet me in three formal debates. And we tried for almost a month to get it done, but he left. He tucked his tail between his legs and he went back to the United States of America. I am saying I'm, if I were a betting man at this juncture, I would almost bet, and again, if the debate doesn't take place for now on Friday, I would almost bet that's what's going to happen. They have got to try to make themselves look good, to maintain some modicum of appearances, because as it stands now, they have really, really embarrassed themselves. So anyway, all right, with all of that, okay, I want us to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now, last week, Daniel and I talked about uh, some key issues from the Song of Moses. And we talked about how the New Testament, Jesus particularly in Matthew 17, 17, quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32, where the Lord said, this is a faithless generation. Well, Matthew 17, 17 is absolutely not by any stretch of the imagination. The only place in the New Testament that quotes, that cites, and that alludes to Deuteronomy chapter 32. But I want to focus, before we get directly into that, I want to notice something that I've pointed out, that, that Daniel and I pointed out a couple of different times in our study of this great chapter. Twice, twice in the Song of Moses, the Lord says that the song, that this chapter, and of course that goes all the way back into chapter 31 as well, but nonetheless, we are told that it has to do with, it involves a time Long after Moses' death, Deuteronomy 32, the last three, oh, 31, uh, the last two verses. Number two, it involves a time of after many generations to come. Deuteronomy 32, 7 and following. It involves the last days. It involves 
Israel's end. (laughs) Pardon me. Mm, Excuse me, folks. Uh, Mountain cedars right there (laughs) as I look out my back window. Um, And it involved, as the Lord said, verse 28, they are a nation void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise. Oh, that they understood this, that they would consider their last end or their latter end, as the New King James Version says. Twice, ladies and gentlemen, twice, Moses says that this song is about Israel's last days, about her end, about her last end. Now, here is what is so incredibly significant about this. In this song, it talks about that time of the end, the last days, when Israel would provoke the Lord to jealousy. And as a result of that, Yahweh would then provoke them to jealousy by calling a people who were not a people a people who had never called on his name, a people who had never known him. He would call them to provoke Israel to jealousy. Now, we have a lot to say about that here momentarily. In the rest of the chapter, what do we have? We have the New Testament writers over and over and over again quoting from and alluding to this chapter to speak of, quote, the last days, unquote, to speak of the time of the end, unquote. And they are referring to the coming of the Lord. Oh, um, a time of Pestilence, time of bitter destruction. You know, you look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 23. I will heap disasters upon them. I will send my arrows upon them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence and bitter destruction. I will also send against them the teeth of beasts with the poison of serpents and of dust. Folks, does this remind you, it should, of Matthew chapter 24, when the apostles ask about, The coming destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus said prior to that event, there were going to be famines, earthquake, pestilence, wars, rumors of wars. Folks, that's Deuteronomy 32, 23 and following. Well, okay, think about this. In the amillennial world, it is said that Israel's last days were the generation or the time before the cross, because after all, God removed the law of Moses at the cross. Well, look, folks, uh, you know, if if the law of Moses was nailed to the cross, then that was the end of Israel's last days because Israel had no days without the covenant. Israel was defined by the law of Moses. Without the law of Moses, it was not, quote, Israel because Israel's the 12 tribes to whom the law was given. There is such an inseparable bond between Israel and the law that to destroy the one is to destroy the other. Levinson, John Levinson, uh, and other scholars have noted, uh, Stevenson, in in his book, Power and Place, The Importance of Temple in the Ancient Days, I think that's, that's pretty close to the title, points out that the temple was so important in the identity, in the self-identity of Israel, that for the temple to be destroyed was to call into question Israel's very election. Well, what did the temple represent? It represented God's covenant with Israel. That's what it represented. The temple and the law 
are absolutely inseparably bound up with one another. And so when Jesus predicted that that temple was going to be destroyed, not one stone will be left standing on top of another. That was, that was utterly devastating. But again, the point of it is that when the Lord said in Deuteronomy 32, 23 and following, I'm going to heap disasters upon them. I'm going to send my arrows upon them. They'll be wasted with hunger. Guess what? That's the famine of Matthew 24. They're going to be de- devoured by pestilence and bitter destruction. That's Matthew 24 for Israel's last days. And here's the point I was about to make. Since this is predictive of Israel's last days, but it is descriptive of events well after the cross, when the law of Moses was supposedly nailed to the cross, how could it be describing Israel's last days if Israel's last days came to an end on the cross when the law was supposedly nailed to the cross? Do you see the point I'm making, ladies and gentlemen? This is really, really important. You cannot say that the law passed away at the cross without saying that Israel's last days ended at the cross. Those are just, those are two inseparable uh, realities, the law and Israel's days, Israel's covenant, covenantal days, covenantal age. And yet here we are in Deuteronomy 32, 23 and following, being given a description of Israel's last end, her last days being described as the time of famine and pestilence, warfare, etc., etc. And and so this passage becomes more than definitive, really, in showing to us Israel's last days did not end at the cross. Israel's last days did not end until A.D. 70 with the destruction of the temple, which is when all things written were fulfilled, Luke 21 and verse 22, thus bringing the law to its end. The law, the covenant, and thus Israel's covenant age bringing that to an end with the destruction of Jerusalem. So, I mean, this is just a tiny bit more of a flavor of how important Deuteronomy chapter 32 is for our understanding of the New Testament. We have a passage here speaking of Israel's last days, but it's speaking about the time after the cross when the law and Israel's covenant And therefore, Israel's covenant age supposedly came to an end. And by the way, we we could have kept reading here. The sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within for the young man and virgin, the nursing child with the man of gray hairs. Jesus is describing essentially what Micah would say at a later period of time. Micah chapter 7, a man's enemies shall be those of his own household. In other words, enemies from within and enemies from without. And so once again, we are descript- we have a description of the time after the cross. But let's go back to verse 20 and following. I will hide my face from them. Why would the Lord hide his face from Israel? By the way, keep in mind, This is talking about Israel's last days. I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation. Folks, don't forget. Do not forget. Peter in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, Paul in Philippians chapter 2, quoted from this verse to speak of their generation. This wicked and perverse generation, not some future generation. Children in whom is no faith, they have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by 
a foolish nation. Now, what I want you to do, folks, and I, I hope you'll do this with me, I want you to put a marker right there because we're uh, time permitting. We're going to come right back to it because it's so. This is such an important text. What what was Yahweh saying here in Deuteronomy 32? They're going to provoke me to jealousy. I'm going to provoke them to jealousy. I'm going to use a nation that is not known to me, a people that I've never known. I'm going to use them, that unknown nation, to provoke Israel to jealousy. So then, let's go to Romans chapter 10. Now, um, many, many scholars have noted the importance of the Song of Moses in this chapter. Romans chapters 10 and 11, to be honest about it. But not only Deuteronomy 32, Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, but I want to focus obviously on Deuteronomy chapter 32. Paul in Romans chapter 10 begins by saying, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record to God that they have a zeal to God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of the righteousness which is of God, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness which is of God. Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. In other words, righteousness through and by the law could only be attained if and only if a person kept the law. Well, the unfortunate tragedy of that is in Galatians chapter 3, 10 and following, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, the law demanded absolute perfection. Whosoever keeps the whole law and yet offends in one point, has broken the whole law, said James in James chapter 2. That's the nature of righteousness under Torah. That's what Moses described. The man who does those things shall live by them. But, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Don't say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from there or from above, or who shall ascend, or excuse me, descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What does it say? Well, he quotes from Deuteronomy. The word is nigh you, even in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if you can, that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes under righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, see, Paul, Paul is now going to call Torah as his witnesses against Israel. In order to convict them, in order to convert them. The, the scripture says, whoever believes in him shall not be put to shame, because there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is over all, is rich to all who call upon for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Paul gives that marvelous, well, how shall they call on him in whom they they have not believed. How will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written. Okay. Paul starts bringing forth this cadre. This series of 
witnesses from from the law to prove his point concerning Israel. So he quotes from Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad, glad tidings of good things. Okay. Well, they can't believe until they hear. Well, they've heard. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of grace or of peace. So there you have it. Isaiah foretold the sending out of the messengers, preach peace. By the way, Paul's one of them. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. Verse 16. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Uh, You see, even in Isaiah's day, Israel was rebellious. Even in Isaiah's day, Israel refused to believe. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, Lord, have they not heard? That is, Paul saying, has Israel of his day not heard? Well, just like in the days of Isaiah, yes, they heard because Isaiah preached to them just so it was in, in Paul's day because Paul was preaching. So Paul says, yes, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? More witnesses, more witnesses. Well, first, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will anger you by a foolish nation. Where is he quoting from? Well, we all know by this time, don't we? He's quoting from Deuteronomy 32. You remember that? All the way back there in the song, the Lord says, you provoke me to jealousy, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy by a nation that you do not know. Because I'm going to call a nation to me that has never known me. That's the Gentiles. That could never be said of the ten northern tribes, by the way, even though God disowned them. And even though God said that they would be cast out among the nations and swallowed up among the nations, they were still Israel. So Paul accuses Israel of his day of being guilty of provoking the Lord to jealousy and he quotes Deuteronomy 32, 21 and following to say that the Lord was in his day and in his time and in his ministry provoking Israel to jealousy. How was Paul provoking Israel to jealousy? <laughs> By preaching. To the Gentiles. You remember Paul <clears throat> was with Trophimus, and the Jews thought that Paul had taken Trophimus into the temple, and they were getting ready to kill him. And the Roman centurion rescued Paul, and Paul asked for permission to preach to the audience, and he was given permission to preach, and he rehearsed an awful lot of Israel's history. And they stood there, and they listened very quietly. But then, but then, oh boy, but then, Paul recounted the Lord's commission to him. I am going to send you far away to the Gentiles. I am going to use you to call them out of darkness to light. And to give them an inheritance among the children of light. And it's at that point that the Jews came unhinged. It is at that point that the Jews took up stones to try to kill Paul. Now listen, I want you to listen to me very carefully. This is a little bit of a digression, but it's not a digression. Because you see, Paul is talking about preaching to the Gentiles 
offering the message of salvation to the Gentiles, and the Jews won't have it. Paul is provoking them to jealousy. Do you see that? Oh, but you see there's something else here. The restoration of Israel, the restoration of the ten tribes, was an intrinsic element of the eschatological hope of Israel. It is found in Isaiah 2. It is found in Isaiah 10. It is found in Isaiah 34, uh, 24, excuse me. It is found in one Old Testament messianic prophecy after another. It is a fundamental element of messianic prophecy. When you find prophecies of the resurrection, that resurrection prophecy is couched within the framework of the restoration of all 12 tribes, Ezekiel chapter 37. When you find prophecies uh, of the time of Jerusalem being reconstituted and no longer a physical capital of the Lord, as in Jeremiah chapter 3, a time when the Ark of the Covenant would, would no longer be remembered, it would not be brought to mind. It would be the time in which both houses of Israel would be restored. Now, the point, the point of all this, and I could go on and on about it, the point of all this is, is it was a fundamental element, a fundamental tenet of Israel's eschatological hope that the ten northern tribes, quote, Israel, unquote, would be restored in the kingdom. Now, if, but not really if, more accurately, since a fundamental foundational tenet of Israel's eschatological hope was the restoration of all 12 tribes, which means the restoration of the 10 northern tribes, at least the righteous remnant, if that was an intrinsic element of Israel's eschatological hope, then why in the world, ask yourself this question, why in the world, in Acts 9, Acts 21, when Paul told the Jews that God had called him to go to the Gentiles, who the I.O. folks claim are Israel. See, the Israel-only folks claim that Israel was the Gentiles and the Gentiles were Israel, and that only Israel was to be the focus of Israel's last day's salvation. Well, okay, if Israel was the exclusive focus of the last day's salvation, and if Israel equaled the Gentiles and the Gentiles equaled Israel, if the Jews of Paul's day knew that Israel was the Gentiles, then when Paul said that God called him to send him to the Gentiles, they should have been jumping up and down with joy, with elation. The time of the kingdom had arrived. Instead, they want to kill him. Why? Why? Now, it is absolutely true that in Scripture itself, there was the doctrine of the conversion of the Gentiles. Isaiah 2, 2 through 4. I mean, just, oh, Zechariah 2, Zechariah 8, on and on. Uh, a person could go. But the point of it is, yes, there were those prophecies, and yet Paul is very clear that Israel did not understand that. Israel did not understand or appreciate the fact that the Gentiles were to be brought into the kingdom on an equal footing with Israel. And so when Paul said, that God had chosen him to call the Gentiles to salvation? First of all, if the Gentiles were Israel, and if Israel was the Gentiles, then, then those Jews to whom 
uh, Paul was speaking in Acts 21 should have been elated. They should have been thrilled beyond words that the time of salvation, that the end time, that her last days had arrived. But it said they wanted to kill Paul. Why? Because Deuteronomy 32, 21 and following was being fulfilled. God was in the process of calling the Gentiles who had not been known by God. God was in the process through Paul of calling the Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous so that Israel. Now, listen, remember this. This is, this is really important. Paul went to the areas of the diaspora. Paul went to the regions where the ten northern tribes were scattered. And where did he go? He went to the synagogues. But when he went to the synagogues where the diaspora of Israel was, and when the diaspora of Israel rejected the gospel, as Paul says right here in Romans 11, Lord, they have not believed. They have not believed. By the way, who's, who's he writing to? Romans. Were there diaspora Israelites in Rome? Yes, there were. Acts chapter 28. And they had not all believed. You know, Acts closes with Paul preaching to the leaders of the Israelite community in Rome. Some believed and some didn't. So the point of it is, when Paul went to the diaspora regions where the Israelites were scattered, the ten northern tribes were scattered, what did he do? Well, he preached to them. And what happened when they did not believe? Well, in Acts chapter 13, 41 and following, Paul says, seeing then that you count yourselves unworthy of eternal life, henceforth we turn to the Gentiles. Now, wait a minute. He's already, look, he's already been preaching to diaspora Israelites in the synagogue. But those diaspora Israelites, some of those that he's talking about right here in Romans chapter 10, did not believe. And so what did God do? Well, he told Paul, tell those people. He's in Antioch of Pisidia, folks, a diaspora region. Paul, you tell them, okay, it was necessary that the gospel be preached to you first. But seeing then that you th count yourselves unworthy of eternal life, henceforth, we turn to the Gentiles. And by the way, did they like that? Did they appreciate that? Uh, uh, no. Paul was provoking them to jealousy. In other words, Deuteronomy 32, 21, and following was being fulfilled in Paul's day, Paul's generation, and in Paul's ministry. And this is one of the reasons why Paul could say he was living in the time in which, uh, let's see, the end, or literally ends, of the ages has come upon us. And it's interesting and significant to point out that the force of that text, as pointed out by all sorts of scholars, Richard Hayes, Davidson, and others, as they point out, the force of that text is that Paul was saying they were living at the time in which the goal of all previous ages was being realized. The goal, the destiny, the Greek word, when, when Paul says the, the end of the ages has come upon us, he uses a Greek word, katentao. And katentao means goal attained, destiny reached. And so Paul says, the goal of all of the previous ages has come upon us. Now, I want you to think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Our dispensational friends tell us, no, 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 we're still looking for uh, the goal of the previous ages because it's the messianic kingdom to be established on earth with Jesus ruling and reigning uh, literally, physically, and bodily from Jerusalem 
and we are told by dominionists and postmillennialists, oh, no, 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 the goal of all of the previous ages is the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Reformed amillennialists tell us that the goal of all of the ages is a time in which Jesus comes and he restores physical, material creation, and we have here on earth a material, physical utopia. And Reformed amillennialists tell us the same identical thing. Folks, listen to me. All three futurist views, to varying degrees, and perhaps even in slightly different ways, with different nuances, to be sure, they tell us Paul was wrong. The goal of all of the previous ages was not arriving in the first century at all. We're 2,000 years removed from Paul, and we're still waiting for the real goal, the real destiny, the real hope to be fulfilled. That was not Paul's eschatology. The goal of all of the previous ages has come upon us, Paul said. Uh, listen, folks, you, you can't find a passage that more powerfully, uh, you know, uh, states that the first century was the time of fulfillment of the realization of the prophetic hope. Now, notice, I, I, oh, my goodness gracious, I'm almost out of time here. We've got to go down into chapter 11. I, I, won't, I won't go any further in Chapter 10, except to point out, okay, except, oh, I've got to do this. <laughs> You'll forgive me, I hope. I, I want to point out that immediately after saying, quoting from Deuteronomy 32, where the Lord said, I'm going to provoke Israel to jealousy by calling a nation which is not a nation. He then calls another witness to what is happening in his day, his time, his ministry, and he calls Isaiah as the next witness. Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Uh, folks, he is quoting verbatim from Isaiah 65, verse 1 and verse 2. So Paul, to justify his ministry to the Gentiles, to provoke Israel to jealousy, to bring about the salvation of Israel by the calling of the Gentiles, by the way, quotes from Deuteronomy and from Isaiah. On the one hand, he quotes Deuteronomy 65, verse 1, I was found by those who did not seek me. That's the Gentiles. He then quotes Isaiah 65, verse 2, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. That's Isaiah 65, verse 2. The rejection of the gospel by Israel was the grounds upon which salvation was sent to the Gentiles. Now look, you, you, you've you got to see this. The dispensationalists tell us, well, you know, Jesus came <clears throat> to establish the kingdom. He offered the kingdom to Israel, but Israel rejected the offer. And as a result of their rebelliousness, as a re result of their rejection of the gospel, uh, to use Thomas Isis's words in the book, End Times Controversy, Thomas I said that as a result of the rejection of the gospel and the rejection of the kingdom by the Jews, that unbelief made it, quote, impossible for God to fulfill his offer, his kingdom offer. Therefore, the kingdom offer was withdrawn. The kingdom was postponed until 
sometime in your future in mine. Oh, until Israel's last days. But you see, there is no postponement. And the idea that the rejection of the gospel, the rejection of the kingdom offered by the Jews, caught God off guard to where he had to say, oh my goodness gracious, what's happened here? I didn't know they were going to reject my son. Uh, Okay, uh, what am I going to do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll withdraw the kingdom offer, and I'll go to plan B. I'll establish the kingdom. No, 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 no. Do you see? Do you see how Paul has quoted from Deuteronomy 32, which is, for all practical purposes' sake, at the very beginning of Israel's covenant history, But here at the very beginning of Israel's covenant history, it predicts Israel's last end, predicts that in her last days, Israel would reject God's word, and as a result of that, God would call the Gentiles. Folks, listen, the calling of the Gentiles was no accident. It was no internal measure. It was no plan B. It was part of God's plan For Israel all along. Oh, not only in Deuteronomy, but in Isaiah. I mean, after all, that's what Paul is quoting right here in Isaiah 6, uh, excuse me, Romans uh, chapter 10, 20 and 21. He is quoting Isaiah 65, 1 and 2, which was written 600 years before the establishment of the church, before the calling of the Gentiles, and yet Paul quotes it verbatim and says, what Isaiah foretold is being fulfilled right here, right now, in the calling of the Gentiles, my ministry, my commission, as I go into all of the world. And then Paul continues, and boy, I'm just nearly... Whew, I'm nearly out of town, out, out of time. Almost said I'm out of town. Not really. Oh, here we go. In Romans 11:11, 11, 11, have they stumbled? You know, Paul has just said that Israel's rejected the gospel. He has just said that God is calling the Gentiles as a result of that. And so in verse 11, he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. It wasn't hopeless. There was time. But through their fall... Through their fall, Israel's fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. If their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. Paul was applying the Song of Moses to his day, his time, and his ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, it just doesn't get any plainer than that, really. The Song of Moses is paradigmatic for the New Covenant. For the very first century, the time of of the fulfillment of all of God's promises to Israel and thus bring salvation to the world. Hey, thank you for joining me for this evening's Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. With that, I will say good night and God bless.